Uh, this is very aquatic, I think, and uh, you're really invited to um, dip and dive and all of that. Oh, those two forms, you see there's a circle in the middle and uh, those two forms which are touching. Uh, when I saw that, I decided to put a circle around it and I, I, was, I actually found myself thinking of uh, Michelangelo's uh, creation of, um, of um, Adam. Now, uh, this again is my graphic work, working out the legacy of Picasso and of high modern, high European modernism. This is called Poolside. Uh, it's owned by a very interesting art world couple, uh, Lisa Liebman and uh, Brooks Adams. How they have the courage to live with it, I don't know. It's five feet by 10 feet. They have it in their dining room. Um, I painted this at a rather difficult uh, period in my life. And um, I think it expresses a lot of anguish uh, that vertical uh, black figure looks like someone trembling at the edge of this uh, fiery abyss and uh, the figure is armless, which I think is a metaphor f for a feeling of helplessness. And, um, but you can see that it's uh, very graphic and uh, of course I, I don't censor myself, so I, often I, I find that when I'm finished, I see that there's a story there which I couldn't have possibly imagined or put in there. So when I give you these interpretations, they're ex post facto. Please don't imagine that I set out uh, with the goal of actually uh, doing that. Now, again, uh, this is from the uh, same period and it's called Broad Front Advancement. Here I think there might be a little influence of Sequeiros, uh, you know, one of the Mexican mur muralists, this thing of uh, forms tilting forward, leaning forward, fa whole phalanxes of them. Again, I think this is quite a naughty, it's very, it's very male, uh, all these uh, uh, impatient verticals, and, uh, but a little, like, a little like a sculpture garden. Uh, you'll see that um, the uh, color is, is is becoming translucent. You, you can see through the white to the forms behind. This becomes uh, very important to me. Now, when I was putting all of this together, I was stunned by this. Uh, uh, these paintings were done at, at the same time. That I was actually moving along on two tracks. It's like a two trains parked in a train station side by side, each with entirely different things going on inside of them. Here I think I was working my way through something more recent, more local, abstract expressionism. This again is another birth painting. I only did two of them. It's called The Birth of Painting. It's from 1980. It's down in Texas now. It was bought by a bank which collapsed in the savings and loan scandal. You can, it's now homeless and looking for a home, it's on the internet. Um, so uh, uh, such are the uh, fortunes and uh, adventures of individual paintings. Uh, the one on the right is called Kurosawa Sunrise. I think that um, uh, the title was influenced by a wonderful movie by Kurosawa, which I had seen called Ron, R-A-N. Uh, the birth of painting is eight feet um, by ten feet. Now, this suddenly, uh, we're in entirely new territory. And this is 1984, the same time while those rather hard edge uh, linear paintings were being done. And uh, it's called A Surface on Which to Dwell, which is a little play on a po poem by Elizabeth Bishop uh, called A Mirror on which to dwell. And uh, here I think I've come up with my own space, which I would call a kind of plasma. Uh, that is where space is, is an empty but it's filled. Uh, and uh, color and space become one. And um, where this came from, I couldn't say, but uh, I consider it uh, one of my most important paintings. It's 47 inches by uh, 44. Now, here, this, here, this is a shocker. These, these next two were both done 
1986. Here you see the extreme opposition. And um, the one on the left is called Dreadnought. Uh, you know, a dread, uh, the, the Dreadnought was uh, one of the biggest uh, battleships that the English ever built when they were involved with the arms race with uh, Germany. And of course it means do not dread, don't, don't be fearful. It's six feet by 12 feet. The one on the right is at the um, Albright Knox. It's called Consolidated Light and Power. Seymour Knox bought it and as long as he was alive it hung next uh, to their, their enormous uh, de Kooning. Um, Again, how uh, this, uh, the painting on the right, this, is, this was the train that was going to leave the station. And, um, but um, I, I um, am a, I'm amazed that I could have, these parallel uh, developments could have been going on at the same time. Uh, but uh, in the uh, consolidated light and power, I think I managed to find my own space, which is color space something um, fluid, uh, glowing. Uh, in the other paintings, you know, the, um, the color is opaque. Uh, now it becomes translucent. Everything you look at, you can look into and look through. Uh, so it, and it also, I think I finally found a way of expressing my musicality in this uh, work. Now could we turn the, um, uh, I was amazed. It just, uh, do, you, do you all know who this uh, uh, painting is by? This is a uh, early Mondrian, and uh, it's from uh, 1911. It's quite large. It's uh, 72 inches. That's six feet by 101 inches. It's three panels, and um, I saw it uh, at the Guggenheim, and uh, I think it's a painting that a little embarrasses Mondrian. Uh, specialist. It wasn't, I, to my amazement, in the big retrospective at MoMA about eight or ten years ago. It's called Evolution, uh, which I uh, find uh, a very strange title. After all, when you think of evolution, you know, creatures crawled out of the water, they developed arms and legs. Evolution here seems to be going in the other direction. The, the legs are shrinking into the um, bodies and um, uh, this doesn't, uh, these figures don't look like there's a, a much possibility of uh, locomotion. I think evolution refers to uh, religious evolution. Obviously you see the king of uh, Star of David on the figure on the right. I suspect that the figure on the left is Christianity and uh, the figure in the middle is the, the new dispensation which Mondrian is promising us. And uh, what I find a little troubling is the, is the, her eyes are staring, not at us, but above us and beyond. I have been a great admirer of uh, Mondrian's work, and I'm fascinated by how they're painted. Uh, there was a kind of martyrdom uh, in painting them. You know, there's nothing harder than painting a straight line, uh, although sometimes you wonder uh, whether it, it, it isn't a little like stand, standing on, on one finger. I mean, there are people who devote their lives to doing that, but you wonder if it's worth doing. But he did it so beautifully. But when I saw this painting, I was very shocked because it re reminded me of something which had always troubled me when I looked at his paintings, which is a sense of constriction that I got. And if you talk, um, talk about suppressing your f feminine side. Uh, you can certainly see that happening. Just after this, he discovers Picasso and um, working out of um, Picasso's uh, uh, cubist phase uh, where he had separated contour from mass and uh, sort of uh, atomized mass. Mondrian sets to work sort of tidying all of that up and the evolution is really extraordinarily clear. Oh, yeah. Now here's another. Uh, th this is a early Rothko from 1942. There were two wonderful shows about eight years ago, uh, one at Pace and uh, the other at Joan Washburn's. Um, Klaus Curtis 
had organized the show and he had written this book which accompanied the show on the early Rothko. Now this is called Crucifix and I, see if you agree with me, I, I think uh, this, it's, you, you see there, you see a head in silhouette and then you see two eyes and then you see another head in silhouette. I wonder whether uh, this isn't meant to uh, convey the three, the, you know, the two thieves in Christ, there, and there are quite a few legs. You see those boxes in which the body parts have been put in these boxes rather like a ne Louise Nevelson. They've been piled up with the body parts. Now, again, uh, just as the Mondrian, this gave me a tremendous shock seeing these because, again, it, I got a terrible flash of what had always bothered me about Rothko. And that there is something headless, armless, and trunkless, I mean, legless, about his paintings. And that, um, you know, this it made me wonder whether what's the price of admission to abstraction? You give up your legs and your arms. It's very troubling, uh, certainly for someone like myself who loves to, likes to walk so much. Um, at any rate, I'm not going to presume to settle this, I just want you to think about it because I think it's a um, mind-body, you see. Uh, it's deep and um, it has um, profound implications. I think, of course, a lot of people, uh, that's often a, uh, you find this kind of thinking among it's a, uh, religions, after all, the denial of the body, that's, the body is the problem, it gets in the way of you uh, being eternal. Uh, so this is uh, the religion, uh, kind of religious imagination uh, will often move in this direction. After all, Gothic uh, a sculpture, uh, you know, we've seen this uh, before in, in the Mondrian, this uh, slenderizing, and the head really becomes uh, the most important thing, out of body. Well, you know, but my point would be, you're out of body, you, you, you're also out of your mind. And um, religion, always uh, distrust curiosity and the striving for knowledge. I recently found myself someplace where the only book at hand uh, were the Confessions of St. Augustine, which I had not read in 45 years, but was all there was to read, so I picked it up. And of course, I'm older and wiser about these things, so I was looking for something. Um, I didn't know that what to look for when I was uh, a kid, reading it for the first time. And sure enough, uh, it comes up, you know, the great distrust, uh, uh, condemnation of curiosity, uh, knowledge for knowledge's sake. After all, religion, you've got the answer, right? I mean, you know what it is. You're just wasting your time with all this uh, other stuff. Now, with these, um, uh, a certain kind of painter, you will see that um, they seem to, they arrive at a point uh, which they find personally satisfying and there's, they cease to develop. What that always suggests to me is a certain, um, well, they've arrived at their truth. They may not be claiming, although sometimes they do, that it's the truth for everyone. Uh, you, I have the collected writings of Mondrian. Uh, they're 400, it's a 400 page book and that's, they're very large pages. And, um, Mondrian goes on quite a bit about oppression and liberation. But, um, uh, and, but there's an awful lot of repetition. I don't know if you've ever been in an airport late at night and seen a luggage carousel with three or four bags appearing and rotating silently and then going back and hidden and then they come out again. So now reading Mondrian is like that. You get these, um, these ideas repeating over and over and over again. But you know, oppression, uh, liberation, these, uh, sometimes we have to look into ourselves. Uh, is it the world that's oppressing us, or do we ourselves carry within us demands that we make on ourselves which oppress us? Yes, of course, we wanted to be liberated from them, but maybe what we have to do is um, develop a little flexibility, um, a little um, less uh, rigor, uh, but what I find also in the critical interpretation of art like this is that always great moral qualities are ascribed to the work and to the artist 
as if uh, rectitude and rectangularity were, um, well, go hand in hand. I'm sure there's some kind of connection. We've been talking about agency, about making. Now, God has, an, uh, mankind has uh, come up with the ideal agent. And that ideal agent is, of course, God, uh, who has made everything. What could be a greater agent than that? Uh, what you have here, of course, is the uh, uh, God creating the plants and the moon and the sun. You see, he can create the moon with his left hand. Uh, he reserves his right hand. It's a more difficult job for creating the sun. Talk about hand-eye uh, coordination. And look at that arm. I mean, it's just amazing. Isn't it? And the sense of powers of mind, extraordinary powers of mind. What you're seeing here is a, a reproduction from a book uh, a box set that I own. I'm a proud possessor of it. It was a limited edition, 2,500 copies. It was done after the ceiling was uh, finished. Uh, the books are quite large. They're 17 inches by uh, 20 inches. And uh, this spread that you see is a 34 inch uh, wide um, reproduction. Uh, the, the photographs were done with a Polaroid process and uh, they were on enormous sheets and uh, the fidelity is truly extraordinary. Now, can we talk about detail? What, after these frescoes were cleaned, it became apparent to everyone why they had exerted such fascination. You, we see these frescoes from about 70 feet away and they carry because of the intensity and precision of the detail. Now, here we go. Now, don't be alarmed. Uh, you're now going to see my own uh, creations of various universes. And uh, I'm going to start out with the one on the left. It's called Bifocal Bender. And it's one of my looking up paintings. I've only done two of them. And uh, this was inspired by a wonderful book I own on Bavarian Rococo churches and of the 18th century. Well, Rococo, 18th century, obviously. And um, the great thing about the, uh, the Baroque um, uh, frescoes, ceiling frescoes, is that you have a two-way movement. You feel like you're standing beneath a chimney which is going to suck you right up into the sky. On the other hand, there's the alternate movement of light light coming down, flooding down upon you. And um, at any rate, I had a lot of fun doing this and I, I thought it would make a good entree uh, into this subject of, um, I'll start by showing you global uh, paintings and then we'll move into uh, universal paintings. The one on the right is called World Cup and it's from uh, 1987. Uh, it's a kind of order out of chaos, a painting. You have all these uh, very free shapes and then a geometry imposed on them, which is, uh, it's a little like it's there and it's, it's not there. The one on the left is called Over the Edge and Around the Bend. Growing up as a child in Rochester when it was very hard for people to get attention, and not nearly as easy it is these days, uh, people were constantly going over Niagara Falls and rafts and doing all sorts of things, sometimes happily, uh, sometimes not at all happily. Uh, but uh, So that was always uh, something that I thought a lot about, and of course I'd seen Niagara Falls. But I think you can feel that um, over the edge and around the bend uh, sort of thing. and. Uh, this swerving to one side in a, in a way which seems to describe a uh, spherical volume. Uh, on the right you have cosmic cyclonics and um, this is from 1989. Again, uh, I'm personally very involved in something called sweep and uh, there is the, a, a poetry of sweep and um, 
again, you see this great uh, rising uh, upward movement and uh, around a uh, spherical volume. I think here also, you remember that earlier painting you saw broad front ad advancement? Uh, they're like little sculptures on pedestals. And again, it's a, it's a family portrait, uh, father, mother, sister, brother, and myself. Uh, the one on the left is called New Worlds for Old. Looks like a map. I didn't at all set out uh, to do that, but um, uh, there it is. And uh, it's uh, quite a small painting. It's only 18 inches by 24. That's, that's why the, um, the strokes uh, look so big. It's uh, 1995. Uh, the one on the right is called Swollen Dawning. And that's from 1992. Uh, I think you see that little um, uh, white circle right in the center of the painting. I sort of thought of that as kind of a moon that you, uh, you sometimes you can see the moon in the morning. And like little clouds, uh, those little beige clouds. But uh, you get this whole uh, feeling of swelling and um, uh, turning and shifting. And uh, you see all the forms. You can look into them and you can look through them so that every, nothing resists the eye, uh, which I find, you know, it gives um, uh, color a tremendous amount of life. Now the, the one on the left is called uh, Advancing Warm Front. It's from 1993, it's quite large. It's uh, 64 inches by 60 inches. Again, sweep, uh, this upward movement. When I start out doing these, uh, you, and you must realize I've picked out a strand from my work. Other things are going on at, at the same time. This is a content which emerges. It's never sought. Uh, so uh, it will take quite a long time before the subject emerges. and a little hangover of graphic uh, uh, linearity here. Uh, on the right, it's called upstreaming. Here I think you can see that porpoise, uh, uh, porpoise dolphin sort of thing. You see each, each band of color uh, can be looked into. And of course the blue has wonderful depth. It's like a trough. Uh, the forms are um, hidden behind the color so that the color is at once uh, bound by very elegant, precise contours, at the same time that it's also free of contours and seems to e exist as a kind of gas. Uh, so that uh, I think that a, a, a greatly enriches our sense of, uh, of the color. Again, you can see this uh, great sweeping uh, upward movement. Now, uh, this uh, painting is, on the left is owned by Elliot Carter. Uh, it's a little French joke of mine. It's called Pas de Dieu, D-I-E-U-X. Uh, it's a rather s small painting. It's uh, 20 inches by 24, and it's from 1994. And the one on the right is called The Other Side of the Moon. And uh, that's uh, quite a large painting. It's 67 by 66, and it's from 1980. Now, um, uh, Mentioning Eliot's uh, name, uh, it reminds me that uh, there's a, an a, a little story I'd like to tell you. It's my most treasured anecdote, and it took so many decades for all the elements of it to fall together. Uh, I would say it took about 35 years for me to get all the uh, aspects of it. I had the great good fortune, of course, as a music lover, uh, to know the three C's of American music, uh, Copeland, Cage, and Carter. And I've been involved with contemporary music all my life. I was the first board member for Speculum Music High, which is the oldest continuously performing contemporary arts ensemble in, in the country. And um, uh, Aaron was a very, very great man and um, unbelievably modest and um, charming. Uh, Cage was, I mean, charm incarnate. And um, 
I was very pleased to get to know him. I'd read all his books in school, and uh, he, w he had an enormous reputation. I, uh, I stopped seeing him around 1970 because I began to find his, um, as, uh, when I, as I became a practitioner, I began to feel uncomfortable with his ideas. They, they stopped appealing to me. I've known Elliot uh, for over uh, 40 years, and uh, he, uh, he's approaching 100 and he has all his marbles. He's blooming, rosy-cheeked. It's the most extraordinary uh, phenomenon. Now, uh, my story is uh, for the 80th birthday of Igor Stravinsky, at uh, the New York Philharmonic, it was decided to do L'Histoire du Soldat, which is, al you almost always only hear it uh, in the suite. Uh, it's rare, it was a delightful little theatrical thing you very rarely get to see it. There are three characters. There's a narrator, uh, there is the uh, soldier, and uh, there is the devil. Well, guess who played the various roles? Uh, Aaron, obviously the narrator. Um, Elliot played the soldier, and John Cage played the devil. Well, uh, I'm trying to reconstruct this. I suspected this had to be 1964. That would have been when uh, Stravinsky was 80. Uh, I, was see I, I saw Aaron for lunch, and uh, he shook his head. He, he said, you know, Richard, the, the rehearsals are not going well. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, John can't count. <laughs> well, uh, so I, of course, was uh, waiting for the performance. I got there, and of course, Cage stole the show. He was hilarious and very, very devilish, and poor Elliot seemed absolutely terrified of him. Uh, the story has a lot to do with who's got the violin, uh, whether it's the devil or the uh, soldier. And um, I was reminiscing with Elliot about this maybe 30 years later. And um, he told me, to my astonishment, that Igor Stravinsky came backstage uh, to congratulate them. And uh, he was very nice to everyone and uh, said what a fine job they had done. And then he turned to Cage and he said, oh, Mr. Cage, you know, you're so smart. These other two. They use notes. You don't. That way, no one can hold you responsible. <laughs> Sly old fox. Well, I was telling this story to Lucas Foss, and now, uh, uh, maybe 10 years after that, about eight years ago, and Lucas said, oh, you know, it was my idea to get them all together. I was the composer in residence at the Philharmonic. And of course, Lucas had never heard this story, but I wanted to tell it to you tonight to bring out the, um, the moral, the ethical element in art and the role of choice of preferring. You know, uh, indeed, you're held responsible and how um, easy it is uh, to proceed uh, by method and in which your method uh, solves all your problems for you and you don't have to uh, deep, uh, dig uh, deeply inside you. Uh, there's a wonderful, I think we, we live in a world where of extremes. Uh, you know, um, a great French historian said that mankind is condemned to oscillate uh, between extremes and an even greater Frenchman, Michel de Montaigne, uh, said that um, extremes are easy. You always have an edge to guide you. And um, the middle, proceeding down the middle way, the broad middle way, that is what is hard. And uh, of course, obviously, that's where all the life of choice, the life of the mind, the life of preferring is seen. If you have a process art, uh, the choice, there aren't enough choices there to make it significant in this way uh, in which I'm talking about. Uh, the one on the left is a small painting. It's 36 inches by 24. And the uh, one on the right is We Aim for the Stars, Please Aim Too. Uh, it's at the Guggenheim. 
and um, uh, that that one is quite large. Again, you see this um, the ambiguity of the forms. You can look. Uh, I always, when I painted this, I thought of this as a kind of décolletage, as a two utterly glorious breasts. Uh, you see, you can look into the yellow, uh, and then uh, you can look into the blue, and um, I mean, there's all kinds of uh, places to see. But I thought this had a cosmic uh, quality, which is why I called it that. And I think there's something rather angelic, uh, angel as uh, sky, uh, in the one on the left. Now the one on the left uh, is called Star Charge. Again, it's not a large painting. It's 24 inches by 20. And um, the illusion, uh, I don't know if you can get a sense of it here, but when you see it, when you stand in front of this painting, you swear you could stick your whole arm into it. Uh, it it's really amazing. Now, again, the, uh, this question of detail, uh, you see this, enormous paint stroke. Well, of course, that wasn't just one paint stroke. I went over and over and over uh, to get it right. But it is essentially one movement. Then uh, all these tiny little s stars, uh, I don't know how many miles I put into painting this, but uh, each one was judged. And, you know, I walk across the room and put it in, and then I w walk back, and now where the other one going to go, and that sort of thing. And I, I think the scale thing is fascinating because you have it once something very large, and, um, and then these small shapes. The one on the uh, right is called Speeding Light. Um, again, not a large painting. Um, it's out at the Heckscher Museum on Long Island. I love movement, as you can see. Speed, um, sweep. Now, uh, the painting on the left is um, in uh, Mexico City at the Museo Contemporaneo. It's, it's large. It's uh, 108 inches by 96 inches. Uh, it was done in 1986. It's called, uh, did I say it? Starting. It's called Starting. And uh, I very much had in mind uh, the Big Bang. And I had that in mind right from the very beginning. I usually don't find myself. Uh, in that kind of situation. I uh, w woke up to the fact when I was about 40 that I knew absolutely nothing about science. Uh, and I had become convinced that the thing that was pulling us all into the future was science and technology, and I knew nothing. Well, I got myself a subscription to the Scientific American, which I've been reading for decades now, cover to cover, of course, with, not always with comprehension. But you know, it doesn't make me nervous. I've read so much modern poetry, which I didn't know what was going on. So I don't panic uh, when I don't know. But um, it's, uh, I found, uh, uh, you know, these fantasies about, uh, um, uh, origins of the universe and um, uh, where it's going and how it's evolving. I, I find these uh, things great fun to think about. And the one on the right is called Day One. Again, the same idea where you know, the sense of bursting, forms bursting forth. Uh, it's uh, down in Miami, which I think is a great place for it. Uh, it it's so uh, sunny and um, vital. I felt that um, when I, you remember I was characterizing those two different styles I was working in simultaneously. I felt I came, had come into my own style, but I also felt that I'd come into my inheritance. Uh, the more linear style was I was working my way through my 20th century inheritance. But when I got to my own style, I also felt that I'd come into my inheritance of the entire history of painting. Uh, well, for me, the entire history of painting being really, not necessarily Giotto, but um, maybe starting with the uh, uh, High Renaissance. I know there's some in the audience who are going to raise eyebrows over that, but uh, uh, the, uh, a certain kind of splendor, magnificence, uh, mass, movement, uh, excitement, uh, opulence. And um, so uh, I think those are also elements we're looking forward in terms of subject matter or I'm talking about science, but it's also that I feel uh, uh, I 
gotten connected uh, to the past in a way in which I had never been and had and made it new. Now the one on the left has a very naughty title. Uh, it's Nocturnal Emissions. Uh, I think it could just as easily, easily uh, be called Skateboarder's Delight or uh, Surfer's Dream, uh, but um, I'm, uh, it's uh, turbulent, as you can see, uh, but um, joyous and um, full of movement. Uh, the one on the right, if I, if I knew much about Chinese painting, I mean in a scholarly sense, and if I were ever going to write a book on it, I would like to title the book, uh, They Were at Home, and vastness, which I think the Chinese painters certainly were. And I, I love Chinese painting. And uh, I called it this because it seemed like we were at the grinding edge of uh, creativity. There were uh, uh, these uh, two uh, worlds uh, which seemed to be um, colliding and grinding into one another. Now, um, these two paintings are owned by this same couple. And they're the only paintings I've ever done with the first word is universal. Uh, the one on the left is called Universal Majesty, and the one on the right is called Universal Lotus. So uh, they've got a hammer lock on my uh, universal paintings. Uh, do you think if I started painting other paintings with the title Universal, I would have a guaranteed audience? I don't know. But uh, I'm very proud of uh, these paintings. Now these two that we have up here now uh, I, were done, uh, this is called Body of Knowledge on the left. Uh, they, the two of them were done in sequence and they took me five months. I don't um, paint a lot of paintings. Uh, two years ago I did ten paintings, none of them larger than two by three feet. Uh, probably in this year I might have done six uh, or seven uh, paintings. I was very pleased uh, someone looked at this painting. He said, oh, well, your work is about things that are very small and very large. You, you see, it's called Body of Knowledge. I had this feeling, you see in the upper part, like the rib cage, and in the bottom, uh, the abdomen. abdomen and, uh, but also, uh, you get the sense of uh, some sort of universal forces and um, playing, their, playing themselves out. And this is a really scary one. It's called a business. I've paired it uh, with a much smaller painting. I think it's only about 20 inches uh, high, uh, called Lens. Uh, I think they're all about, uh, you know, destruction. And you could imagine yourself jumping in uh, to this one and coming out the other end as something not recognizably yourself. Uh, but uh, again, it's one of that uh, living at the edge sort of thing and um, uh, imagining jumping in. I think that uh, the one on the right may owe something to um, uh, black holes, you know, in, in physics. Uh, the uh, one on the left is called, uh, uh, this is sort of like subatomic. Uh, physical activity. It's called pictorial chromodynamics, which is a play on um, quantum uh, chromo chromodynamics, which is the theory of uh, subatomic uh, particles. And uh, here you have a kind of micro. Uh, this is much more all over than anything else uh, you've seen. Now, um, I think I've probably, you've probably seen enough images. Uh, we could open the floor to, for discussion. Uh, if you like, I have one more painting. You can turn the one off on the right. We can just say goodbye with this one. This is my most recent. It's called, uh, uh, this is two feet by three feet. And um, it looks so um, raw uh, when you see the strokes uh, expanded in this way. Uh, but it, this is called In the Mind's Eye. And um, the eye does have a mind. And um, who knows, this may have something to do with that. Okay. Uh, 
Are we going to have questions? Only easy ones, yes. Yes. Uh, it keeps, uh, you can't rush with oils. You've got to wait for them to dry. And uh, there's a lot of waiting. But uh, often they're glazes, so uh, generally uh, they're dry the next day, so I can go back. But uh, there's lots of time to mull over your next move. Do you, uh, do you use glazes? Is that what you say? Yeah. Well, um, uh, th they are the, uh, th that's how I'm able to get the radiance. And I think, you see that, uh, uh, no one's used gl glazes for centuries. You know, the, the dry look came in with the impressionist and the unvarnished look. Uh, this is the wet look of the high renaissance and uh, you, that kind of depth of color that you can only get with glazes. Do you use Venetian No. I just use Windsor Newton. Pardon? Um, should I give my trade secrets? <laughs> I'm willing to, but maybe not. We could talk privately later. <laughs> when I'm surrounded by technicians, well, it, it, there's no mystery to it. Uh, it's Liquin. It's a uh, Windsor Newton. Yes. Uh, how much thought do you give to typing? A lot. It's my last chance to affect the interpretation. Although I, I don't. It it can set you off in a certain direction. I don't want it to be apodictic. You know that that this is really all there is to it. But uh, you know that I had a period when I would just the, I would make the title be the date they were finished. It has no mnemonic value. I could never remember them. Titles have a usefulness. You can remember. Uh, them, but I find that um, sometimes the title becomes just a little bit before I'm finished. Uh, it it's suggests w what the subject matter is, and um, I, I enjoy it. And sometimes I have to wait for days and days and days and days to get the title, and then it bing. No, I, it's a very minor, uh, of very small goals. Very, I, I might need to see red. And because um, I haven't seen it in a while, uh, I need to use a certain brush. I, can't, I don't see that far ahead. And of course, you just, um, you feel an impulse and uh, you don't uh, censor it. And uh, then, um, well, as Napoleon said, on s'engage, puis on voit. Uh, you jump in, and then you see where where it leads. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why you see so many subjects uh, in my work, and the, each painting is so different. Uh, because I'm not impressed by verbal formulations. Uh, I don't divide myself into two people, the boss, who comes up with the sentences, which are the orders, do this, do that. And then I'm the grunt, you know, and I have to do what my, the boss told me to do. Uh, I'm looking for, I'm not impressed by those verbal formulations because I don't think they contain much information. And you have to go deeper. Something that, what, if you f follow your impulse, you do it. Then you look and you say, oh, I know why I did it. And you could have all the reasons in the world. But if you hadn't done it, you wouldn't know. If you need reasons, uh, you're going to be, you're, you're going to narrow uh, what you do. I'm not enthralled to words. And I, if, I've set up, if I set out to do anything, it was to make an herb that couldn't be summed up, that would defeat words. Critics be warned. <laughs> Did you hear that? Oh, I wasn't speaking into the microphone. Could you hear me? Any more questions? What you're saying just now, um, how does that affect you? You're talking about process art. Was that when you discover as you go, and you're talking about choices? Just to connect this 
Well, process art tends to be um, produced by a very limited number of choices. It's a method. And um, I think there's a, there's a tremendous amount of process art out there. Uh, I, you know, there was Bryce Martin, Cy Twombly, um, Ken Noland, Agnes Martin. The um, Museum of Modern Art seems to have um, uh, done a complete 180 degrees. Uh, you remember about uh, two decades ago when it was possible to see uh, two retrospectives of Frank Stella before he was 60 years old. Uh, that kind of hell's a poppin', um, literal uh, graphic art seems to have gone out of fashion at the modern, and, and they're now doing a, uh, something that's uh, much quieter. Uh, but uh, I don't know if any of you ever saw Fellini's movie uh, called The Clowns. Uh, it uh, came out in 1970. You saw it? I absolutely loved it. Uh, alas, I only saw it once. I'd love to see it again. But I was stunned uh, because um, there are evidently two kinds of clowns in uh, Europe, which I hadn't known. The kinds of clowns we know with the baggy trousers, the big shoes, the red wigs, the bulbous nose, all of that. But there's another kind of clown, which is the elegant clown. And they have white uh, cone-shaped, uh, truncated cone uh, caps, and uh, they wear these uh, beautiful sort of courage-like uh, suits with, covered with dazzling sequins, a white face. Uh, they're very elegant. And so I guess we're, um, the modern is an, is an elegant uh, face. Again, what you see, we're just going back and forth from one to the other. However, slowly, uh, I suppose we can, in another 20 years, we could look for um, literalism again, the noisy style. Uh, right now, silence uh, seems to be ascendant. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs>